Friends, friends, in one generation, our young kids will be asking us why we even bother to drive our own cars. Each generation hasn't just a challenge, but really a responsibility to reinvent the future. In fact, I believe we have to ask ourselves, what will we make of that moment in time? Now, some of you may have recognized the music from the quiche Irwin Allen sci-fi TV series of the 1960s, Time Tunnel. In fact, this is my 10-year-old's rendering of a pic collage done uh, kind of in a little bit of a Hitchcockian mode where she inserts herself on the left over there. But uh, uh, when I was growing up, and, when I, and my brother, and I'm sure some of us have, a lot of you all have older siblings, used to make me watch these sci-fi thrillers of the 60s. You know, there were the Jetsons and Star Trek and, and, uh, and Time Tunnel. Uh, Lost in Space was my favorite. But in Time Tunnel, I got my first realization of trying to understand the past, the present, and the future, how these link together, and how can I really try and, 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 and do something that makes a different impact in the world. Well, I got my first abrupt surprise awareness when I, I literally tried to kill Napoleon in one of the episodes, which would have been a temporal paradox um, and would have greatly changed not just the roads in Paris, but you know, the current history. So I tried to understand how am I going to understand what the relationship between the present and the future is gonna be. So I was a child of an immigrant family who came here in the 60s. Uh, and uh, like most of the kids at that age, we were sort of conditioned from large families to think about our future. And my family really did what most families did in, those genera in that generation, in the 60s, was to sacrifice their future in order to put us through school, give us good educations. So there was this sort of relationship between investing in your future um, by doing sacrifices and making sacrifices in, in, your, in your present. So, off to the good schools I go. I went to Wellesley, and then to MIT, and then to Wharton, where I learned over and over again the relationship between past and future. But this time, I was taught something slightly different. I was taught time value of money. And this concept of you know, taking more money from the future and investing it, or actually using it and spending it today, was, was, was kind of interesting for me. I mean, I, I took advantage of the student loans, like most of the kids in those years. And what, what even was even more interesting is if I had money, I thought I could lend it out as an investment and, and get some sort of a probability of outcome for future returns. So this was also kind of in, you know, in, indoctrinated into our minds as, as, uh, as we were coming out of the post-Second World War economy. John Maynard Keynes, the famous British economist, kind of indoctrinated and taught the, the philosophy of, you know, again, borrow from the future to invest in today and create jobs and spend money. And we, we went so far as to even create this big sort of money printing machine where we would continue to borrow from the future uh, and uh, to fund the present. So the first decade of the 21st century, like most people, I bought my first house. And uh, what happened, unfortunately, is a lot of people bought houses. And then when house, housing prices didn't materialize and go up, we all had a rude awakening when um, we lost, or a lot of people lost their homes because they had borrowed too much. And the value, when the value of the property didn't match what the, um, what the expected outcome was, people ended up for selling their homes. And, and this is the 10 city uh, case Schiller index where you see a, a drastic drop in house prices. In fact, between the years 2006 to 2012, housing prices fell about 35%. If you had invested in the, um, in the appropriate seven-year treasury bill at that time, you would have actually earned about 4.935% a year, which would have materialized into a 31% positive outcome versus a 35% um, loss. So that mental image to me, start, I started to question the, the paradigm between you know, expecting profit by investing today and making money in the future. It, it kind of busted my timetable of a mental paradigm about the relationship between past and money, can, and past and future connected through money. So this again came up in, in, in this kind of return on education concept because many of us spend our, our healthiest, 
our youngest, sort of our, 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 our strongest years, educating ourselves. Again, borrowing money in the future and investing in today, thinking that we are going to have a positive outcome associated with that. What we really don't think about is the fact that there's quite a lot of random um, probability associated with that outcome. So at Stanford, for example, most private colleges in this country, it, it's about $60,000 a year. And if you think about that together with the student loan paybacks, um, unfortunately, the, you know, as years are going on, it takes an average of one year for a college graduate to now be finding a job. So a lot of people are starting to question the classic relationship on return on equity, on return on uh, education. And we're seeing that more and more with uh, proliferation of, of online training programs like Udacity and Khan Academy, where the marginal cost associated with that education is much, much lower. And uh, I think there are about 7 million people now who have who are uh, applied for online training, and, and, it's, and it's growing and growing like weed. So this is, again, another area where we question this. This is a very sad sort of um, example or, or sort of a reflection of today's society. These are the kids in, 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 uh, in Greece sort of riding after um, we had the big uh, problems with the EU, and the kids are basically investing in their own future. They're not doing anything wrong, but because the country hasn't invested in, her, in itself, there are no jobs. And in a neighboring country not too far away, in the 40s, my grandmother, a very uh, religious, pious woman, uh, was putting my father on an air float Tupolev to send him off to medical school. And she makes a little picnic basket for him, and she gives it to him, and then she walks up to the pilot. In those days, you could just walk on the, on the launch pad. And she said, uh, you know, you're carrying my son. He's going off to medical school. This is my father. You're carrying my son. He's going off to medical school. You know, I want you to fly low and slow in case anything <laughs> happens. So my grandmother was obviously not an aerodynamics expert, but she had, the, she, she had the common sense to understand that the future of my father was more important than what she could give him. And at the time, by creating my father's future, she was obviously creating our past. So it didn't necessarily work out bad for everybody, but again, there's that kind of you know, assumption that these probabilities will actually turn out in a positive way, but actually they're quite random. And as you can see, um, my uh, daughter's father, um, who was also a great believer in education, uh, he had five degrees from engineering and computer science from MIT, um, but at the tender age of 49, uh, he suffered a massive brainstem stroke. And, um, you know, this is again a situation where you have a probable outcome, that a randomness of what can happen to someone who invests considerably in his own future, and the future never really quite comes in the way that you expect it. Um, he'll never be able to really participate in, in a healthy future with my daughter. And uh, that put me in a very difficult position because I was entering into midlife and uh, having a, a personal crisis with a family kind of expectation. You get married, you have a child, and everything works out nicely. We've heard that story. Unfortunately, there is a, quite a lot of a random outcome associated with that, with that too. Um, so what do I do? I basically do what every normal modern woman does is try to reinvent myself. And the difference here is, is that when there's a little child running around that's carrying your DNA and, 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 you and, and you realize one morning that you're all she has to depend on, something stiffens up in your body. And you basically accept the fact that there is, you know, there is, there is no other way except up. And, uh, and this comes with a certain degree of passion, a certain degree of commitment that we just wake up every morning and we keep going. So, I had always had a passion for transportation. And uh, in fact, you'll see that's kind of the way I get around at, at Google and, and during the, on the campus. It's, it's not a very convenient approach to mobilizing yourself because you can't carry anything. On the right, I'm, I'm running around in a chauffeur-driven car in Turkey, and obviously that's not an economically sane idea because how many of us have the ability to have chauffeurs day in and day out? So uh, this rendering on the left is in the 1800s how people got around. This was the Wells Fargo stagecoach in the 1890s. And it took on average 5 to 12 miles an hour. And therefore, that meant that if you were in the stagecoach, every 12 miles you had to get out uh, while the horses you know, either were fed or relaxed or a change of horse maybe. Uh, and I submit to you that if we had relied on this transportation technology today, none of you would be here. Why? Because it would have taken you six months or so to get here. <laughs> So in walks a gentleman by the name of Henry Ford. And Henry Ford had this thought that um, maybe I can kind of change the way this whole transportation paradigm works. So he 
came up with a concept of, um, of not necessarily speed. I mean, this quadricycle that he's in here uh, is only goes about 20 miles an hour. And if he had just thought about building something that, that, that was faster, he would have probably invested in thoroughbred racing and, and, uh, and, and, and built something that relied upon much faster sort of horsepower. But no, he thought about the concept of affordability and about the fact that everyone should have access to this technology. Therefore, he created the Model T in 1908, and the Model T uh, sold for about $900 in 1908, and six years later, it sold for about 280, a third of its price, and in 10 years, Half of every car on the road belonged to Ford. So it, it wasn't just about changing speed and the paradigm of like how fast you can get around, but it was also about giving autonomous decision-making capability to each and every one in that assembly line station to be able to make a decision that would enable these cars to be built fast, affordable, and therefore change the way we as a society moved around. So this is something that was promised to us back in the 50s, right? Between 1908 and 1920 and 1930, all of a sudden, 1956, World's Fair Houston, we have a car that's, a, you know, basically an autonomously driven car. It operates by itself. This young family is playing life or Scrabble or whatever they're doing, and they're having a good time. Well, how many of you have cars like this today? <laughs> so what happened? Well, this is a classic case where, as a society, again, we depend on a change of infrastructure. Well, we all know that depending upon somebody else in order to move ahead with your own thoughts is, is probably not a very good formula for success. So I, I, I'd like to ask you, if the computer had been invented before the car, don't you think computers should be driving our cars by now? The key differential here is, is that computers really have much better capability to communicate, to synthesize large quantities of data, and to be able to make decisions far better than a human being. So this is a rendering of the most recent, I think it's the Tokyo, no, it's the Geneva Motor Show, 2014, um, sort of a kind of a depiction of, of Tesla working together with a company called Renspeed, and what the classic car right now ought to have in it. It's a 32-inch screen, people are relaxing, kind of like in the first class cabin of, a, of an airplane. And, and, and to some degree, if the computer had been around and had been inventing by now, we probably would have a car that does very many different things than your classic version of a car today. It probably would not look like a car. It would look maybe something a little bit not too, dif not too uh, different from this, but who knows? But in order to be able to kind of work on this, as a society, the Department of um, advanced uh, projects, uh, decided to curate this, this technology of, of self-driving cars, tried, kind of tried to bootstrap this through the university system by creating a $1 million challenge to the university that was able to create a drone vehicle in the desert in 2004. This became known as the Grand Challenges. Well, in 2004, guess how many people finished, or guess how many vehicles entered that finished the race? Z zero, basically, right? So what does the government do? In this case, they decide to up the ante. They'll have a $2 million prize in 2005. So in 2005, a number of different cars got together again, the same professors, the same universities, the same kind of teams of people, and lo and behold, we had seven cars finish uh, 150, 123-mile race, and then in two in two years later, two years later, there was the DARPA Urban Challenge. By the way, this is the vehicle that finished. This is uh, the team that built this car. The, the Stanford Stan Stanley is is part of our team right now. And then in 2007, with the Urban Challenge, everyone finished. It was a simulated urban environment rather than a Mojave Desert type environment. And uh, you had seen in, in about three, four years, this technology had become very, very um, useful. So Google made the decision to hire the teams, the founding teams of the, the, the winners, the basically CMU, Carnegie Mellon and Stanford and others, you know, the robotics, the scientists, the, the university professors, and get together and create a sort of a, a, a formula uh, in its little incubation lab called Google X that ostensibly took the technology that we have, throw it on the wall to try and solve a problem with radical solutions. 
And this is, I mean, it's, it's not too dissimilar from the Xerox labs we had back um, in, in the last couple of, or the last decade. But more importantly, the groups that made up the teams of people that started working on these technologies weren't necessarily the kinds of people you and I would hang out with. I mean, these people were scientists and roboticists and, and electrical engineers and mechanical engineers. But a lot of this also involves quite a lot of potential risk of failure. And um, I think, you know, this is a rent rendering of the, uh, the 1958 Vanguard. Um, it was the, uh, the Department of Defense um, first attempt to send a satellite into space. And, you know, it's not that it, it's not important the fact that it, it wasn't a happy day. It's more important that it really set the platform for the Apollo and the space pl program. And so with a lot of, when you reach for technology, one of the most important things to understand, and we talked about this in many of our different talks today, ironically, is this concept of failing. In fact, you know, failing is, in, in Google X, and, and the way I look at it is if, if, you haven't, if you haven't failed, if you haven't been failing, you probably aren't trying hard enough. So this, this concept of failing your way to success is not something that's indigenous to technology, but it's something that kind of classically creates a cradle of, of, of almost inherent you know, acceptance that you have to accept failure as part of this. So again, another failure, the 1958 Edsel. How many of you all owned Edsels or remember Edsels? Uh, this was a Ford vehicle that sold 160, 116,000 units and cost the company roughly a little over $3 billion. So if Ford had accepted failure back in, the, in 58 and not continued to sort of reach to higher, higher degrees of, of technology and success, they probably wouldn't have been around today. This concept of failure is so sort of radically part of my DNA that uh, <laughs> I failed so much. The last year I actually won the Women's uh, Technology Award for Courage. Beca and, <laughs> and this is... <laughs> This is, this is very important to me because obviously I shared it with my 10-year-old daughter and as, as you all know, we're very important role models. My daughter is here in the audience today. Why am I doing what I'm doing? I mean, here's a woman that basically has no electrical engineer training, pro training that has no mechanical engineer training, pro that has no vision or software knowledge whatsoever. But I, I did have something that was useful to the program. I had the ability, the formal sort of business and, and social science and, uh, and, and financial training to take these science-type projects out of the science box and put them into the real world. And for me, that was critical, and, and for our team that was critical, because without the, 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 the strength and the wisdom and the ability to fail in understanding human science, you're not going to have this technology really touch people. And it could actually just sit in the sandbox and never really materialize. But why am I doing this? Not only is my passion for transportation something that's, that pushes me forward, but also I have a problem with driving. I don't like to drive. Driving to me is a distraction, right? I want to be doing things in the car, not necessarily putting makeup on, but maybe learning how to play a trumpet or maybe doing some other stuff. These are pictures, actually, these are pictures from my daily commute. I'm not making this up, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so if you think about it, if you think about it, the average person in this country spends an hour a day commute. That's an hour of our productive time that we could be doing so many other things within the car. So why do we bother driving? And I, again, I started by saying our kids in one generation will be asking us that. And if, if I get invited back in 10 years or 15 years, whatever a generation is, I will guarantee you that you all will be applauding this particular moment. But in any case, it, by, by any other terms, 35,000 deaths a year would be an epidemic. Why are we as a society accepting 35,000 deaths? Why are we accepting 90% of those collisions, fatal collisions, to be in some form of human error related? The most important thing here that I also stand very strongly behind is we have an aging population. One of every five people in this country is going to be over the age of 60 by 2030. And I submit to you that we are not going to be in a position to be continuing to drive our cars by then. So it is going to be something that we have to think very clearly about as to what are we going to do? How are we going to create access, mobility, transportation for the aging, for the handicapped, for people who have vision impairment, for all the multitudes of different reasons why people can't drive today? This also is another reason why I'm in this program. And this is, an, this is a typical highway at at, at peak throughput. 
in America. This is just sort of one rendering of this. And it's 8% surface occupied. So that means 92% of your average highway is being ill-used at any given time in peak traffic. If you think about it, the vehicle miles in this country have gone up by 20%, and road infrastructure has gone up by 2%. That's not going to get any better over the years. So we have to start thinking about how we're going to use our transportation road systems the way they are today, not expecting them to be you know, recreated or infra major infrastructure changes. How are we going to depend on our current, our current infrastructure to build uh, a better life for us? So my daughter and I are on a train here, and I think that, that you know, transportation is a way that I feel we can spend a lot of quality time together. So when I started this program um, three years ago, I was asked by the founder of our group uh, and the founders of the company to come up with a vision to explain what we're trying to do to the world. That wouldn't scare people. Thanks, guys. So I, I, I trolled the web, and there were you know, all these different renderings of robotics and you know, vum, 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 cars that, you know, engines revving up and all. Well, you know, and I was, trying to, I was struggling with the idea of how are we going to explain what self-driving cars mean and can mean to people, to the average human being. How can we create a better, more unified system in which we can truly, truly commit to taking care of, of, of a better life for ourselves? It's not just about a product. It's not about a movement. It's really about changing the human experience. And I think in, in, in technology, I found a way that I can impact the future because I can somehow control the outcome of that. So I'm going to leave you with a three-minute um, movie that I made, which was what they asked me to do, um, which shows how this technology could, in, uh, in fact, impact uh, our lives. <laughs> Good morning, Steve. Hey, Nathaniel, how are you? Doing just great. Go ahead, Steve. Auto driving. Here we go. Away we go. <laughs> Look, Ma, no. <laughs> no hands anywhere. No hands, no feet. No hands, no feet. No nothing. <laughs> I love it. So we're here at the stop sign. Yep. The car's using the radars and laser to, to check and make sure there's nothing coming either way. I find myself looking. <laughs> Old habits die hard, man. Hey, hey, they don't die. Hey, anybody up for a taco? Yeah, yeah. What do you want? What do you want to do today, Steve? I'm I'm all for tacos though myself. All right. Well. Go get a taco at the drive-thru. And we're turning into the parking lot. How neat. There we go. Now we kind of creep along here. Does anybody have any money? I've got money. No, I've got my wallet right here. <laughs> you roll down your window and order a burrito. Yeah, push that. I'm doing very well. How are you today? Good, thank you. This is some of the best driving I've ever done. <laughs> Ninety five percent of my vision is, is gone. I'm well past legally blind. You lose your timing in life, everything takes you much longer. There are some places that you cannot go, there are some things that you really cannot do. Where this would change my life is to give me the independence and the flexibility to go the places I both want to go and need to go when I need to do those things.